All right, we're going to start off with a little exercise here. Don't worry, it's not physical. We want everybody to picture their favorite class they had growing up. Just think on it for a second. All right, do you guys got it? Nathan, share yours with us. So for me, it was when I was in second grade, and I had a chance to create a series of comic books about different historical events. All right, now think about yours again. My guess is it's similar in that you're recalling something you did, and not necessarily the facts that you learned about it. Yeah, for me it was all about collaborating with my classmates, it was about looking at the different comics side by side and drawing distinctions between them. It was a really simple exercise, but it was very powerful to me. Right, and teachers know how this works. Teachers want to be that teacher, the one providing the meaningful, formative experiences for their students. They want their students doing, because if you're not doing, you're not learning. So for the past year, we've been applying these principles to get kids hooked on computer programming and digital design in a gamified classroom. I'm a software developer. And I'm a teacher. And together, we've been inspiring consumers to become creators in a gamified classroom. Yeah. And we found that the most important skill you can have as a creator is self-direction. And the most important tool you can learn to help self-direction is play. Kids spend hours in self-direction when they're at play. They come up with new rules, they invent new realities, they develop new identities. And we encourage this at a younger age. But once they hit adolescence, we sort of change the game on them. We tell them to sit down and memorize jargon. We put a real fine line between working and playing. Eli Nyberger over at the Ann Arbor District Library puts it like this that humans are the only creatures that draw a distinction between learning and play. We think that this is a toxic attitude to have. It's ridiculous to think that every, anybody who's having fun must not be learning. And granted, it can be hard to standardize this or quantify it. The standards were sort of put in there to place to make sure that students are learning at an adequate, challenging level. But more than that, almost to keep teachers held accountable for what they do, rather than to help them provide a meaningful learning experience for students. So if play is to be a valuable learning tool in the classroom, we need to make sure that there's enough context that kids everywhere are challenged appropriately. We need to make sure that there is a sense of direction, that there's guidelines, and we need to be very intentional with it. Which sounds kind of like a game, right? Absolutely. One of the strengths of games is that it gives kids a safe place to try out new ideas, explore new patterns, um, all without the fear of failure. In fact, failure in games can often be more compelling than success. So what we're trying to say is if it explodes for them, make sure it explodes spectacularly. We've had students fail so hard that they crashed their computers, which, you know, was bad for us. But they were so pumped about it. What do you think they did next? Laughed or cried? They laughed so hard it started a trend throughout the whole classroom of kids trying to break the computer. And they learned a lot about the computer in the process. They were trying out all sorts of crazy algorithms, learning about the limitations of the machine. It was a very memorable experience. Yeah, and it's this sort of playful experimentation that helps kids learn to think and not just learn to record. Now, we've sort of convinced ourselves as a society that intelligence is an accumulation of everything we've heard so far. All standardized tests are at least a little bit based off of that. But all we're really testing that way seems to be memory. And even if we could decide on a fixed set of ideas that we wanted our teachers to impart to our students through a standardized curriculum, we have no idea which of those concepts are actually going to be relevant by the time the kid grows up. The computer programming that I do today is wildly different than the programming that my dad used to do. Right, and it's going to be wildly different from anything they do in 20 years when they enter the profession. If we want them to surprise us in the classroom, we need to give them a sandbox that's bigger than we can actually map, which can be a scary thing from a teacher's perspective. Teaching new technologies is very intimidating for teachers. It's tempting to try to dumb it down for the kids until they get acclimated, but the minute you start to hide complexity is the minute that you cramp that sandbox and make it impossible for them to explore and to surprise you. Right, so look at this. This is a program that a sixth grader wrote. So programmers in the audience will recognize function definitions, variables, uh, for loops, and that's exactly what this stuff is, but in our classroom, we talk about code as if it's a magical spell. In our game, the kids take on the role of programming wizards, sort of like Harry Potter, and they come up with all the ideas that uh, they're going to code into the video games that they play together. So here we've got 
uh, an earthquake spell that rumbles the ground in the game. There's another spell called Stone Wall that builds a protective barrier around the kid. Yeah, and they also use these spells to destroy each other. But the stunning part is that they would interrupt lunch. Which is typically a time that they get a break from programming. Exactly. They would interrupt lunch just to ask us how they could better their program. Now, think about that. We weren't grading them or anything like that. They were curious because of what the code could do for them in their game. Now, all previous experience told me that I was going to have to plead with them just to get them focused on that wall of nonsense. To me, back in the day, that probably would have been a visual sedative. So we adapt the curriculum to the students. By making the content relevant to them, they get to see the content through the lens of their passions. And that becomes crucial once you start to think about the continuum that exists between creators and consumers. And that's an important distinction that we're trying to make here between consumers and creators. Think about for a minute if you were taught how to read but not how to write. Technology's everywhere nowadays. Can you imagine how damning that would be? And that's sort of what we have going on with digital literacy. Not every kid needs to learn to become a computer programmer, but every kid should know what it means to write computer code. And if that's something that's interesting to them, they should have a shot at pursuing that passion. But it's sort of like learning a foreign language. Right, or understanding law. You don't need to be a pro at it, but you should know enough to, say, defend yourself against a parking ticket or negotiate with a landlord, stuff like that. You don't need to be a lawyer, but too much ignorance becomes dangerous pretty quickly. So what we're talking about is meaningful participation in the digital era. We're talking about how do we forge a healthy relationship between our kids and all that technology. It's a really important issue. Right, and gamifying it makes it relevant once again for them. All of a sudden, the high-energy kid who was everywhere in class is now focusing his energy or her energy at the lesson. Now any teacher will tell you, that the only kind of problem students you get in class are the ones who are disengaged. So we saw this play out firsthand. Uh, since February, we've been taking our computer programming classes to a local juvenile detention center. Now, think about for a moment what kind of concerns we might have had taking this free-form, hoity-toity, gamified classroom into an environment like this. We were a bit worried, but what we saw sort of blew our minds. They were more focused, engaged, and attentive than anywhere else we've ever taught before. We didn't change a thing about the curriculum. We just went in there and did it as was, because they were just kids. And these were kids that were opting in to programming classes in their free time. Think about that, that's huge. These kids had no idea they could participate as creators in the digital age, but they were obviously thirsting for it. Right, so we're seeing this work everywhere we've taught it. Let's teach the way we would want to be taught. Let's make learning fun for them. And that's really the point we're trying to drive home here. You don't need to separate gaming and curriculum. Don't make it, you don't need to make it mutually exclusive for anyone. And the continuum that exists between creators and consumers can be helped um, through gamification in the classroom, right? So this is important not only to the students, but it's also important to the digital and the physical communities that they participate in. Right, they just want to play, so let them play. Thanks.